everyone. Uh, just wanted to jump in real quick before we get started and say a quick thank you to all my patrons on Patreon. Uh, thank you for supporting this class. And um, I look forward to creating new videos and new content with your support. So thank you very much. Um, your name should be appearing in this general area right now. Thanks. Even do the lesson. <laughs> oh, that's how it goes. Um, no one has ever directly complained to me about that. So I don't know how much people are bothered if we go a little slowly. I think we're cool. But when I noticed that we were on sentence two at the 18 minute mark, I realized you're probably not going to get all the way to the end. I did, I did too. And that's why like when, when someone wants to slow down and go into detail, if it's already kind of like, well, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a photo finish one way or the other. It's like, well, let's, you know, let's, okay, let's take our time and make sure everyone understands then because you know what, like we're, none of us are, are doing this to, I don't know, you know, we're not curing a disease or something. There's no like, there's no special urgency. Might as well learn it. Um, okay. So I think this is where we stopped. No, wait, said G2 at Metropolis. Did we say that sentence before? I don't think, I think we were left with the one before, number four. Okay. In that case, I have uh, Rasmus. Do you want to do number five? I'd really just listen, rather just listen in this time because I've had a very busy week. So if that's Understood. okay. That's totally fine. Uh, Aurelio, do you want to do number five? Okay. So Achmimik, CG2 at Metropolis. Um, I would say they take them to the city. Yeah. That's really it. Um, um, I would say me metropolis, actually, in this case, just because city would just be police. True, 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 true. Right, yeah. to the metropolis. Mm -hmm. OK, and then what is this? So this is the pre form of G. There's an extra T in yeah. there before the subject pronoun. Uh, sorry, before the yeah. object pronoun. Suffix pronoun. Mm -hmm. Right, suffix. Uh, yeah, object pronoun is fine, too. Uh, it just gets a bit ambiguous because if we do bring in discussions of like earlier stages of the language, the object pronouns um, in proper Egyptian finite verbs are actually something different. They're the, uh, the dependent pronouns. Right, 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 right. And then there's also in Coptic the object pronoun, which is like uh, in a sentence like when uh, taisu, I have them. Uh, this is actually, this can be considered an object pronoun. And it's worth noting that uh, in a construction like this, what actually is this pronoun? What does it come from? The U? Yeah. Hmm, I thought that's more like the, ha, huh, let's see. I mean, I just, no, I, I, it's kind of hard for me to say. I, I mapped that onto like the general suffix pronoun, so to say. Yeah, uh, and it and is. The equivalent of F and S and, and K and whatnot. So uh, that's where it maps into my, my mind space. Uh, okay, let's let's map it more precisely then. Um, <laughs> let's put okay. this. Let's put this sentence. Uh, we'll put this sentence in to late Egyptian. Um, so it's just some of, kind of U and pl uh, plural strokes. It is. Uh, I think this is how you would write this. She, oh, I need, I left out the, uh, I'm gonna put it in there. That's not great, but you get it. Um, so, sen her cheat u. Mm -hmm. So, they are upon their taking. Mm -hmm. So, it's the, um, it is the suffix, the possessive suffix pronoun of an infinitive. So, their taking means taking them. It's been reinterpreted. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's also where the T comes from. As you said, this is the, the uh, pre-pronominal form from G. It's G, G, G. And then what's the what's qualitative? Does this have a qualitative? Taken? G or something? Ooh, no idea. I don't know, but I'm going to put it out there. Uh, I would probably say J if I were like speaking Coptic, you know, as a second language. And then native speakers would know what I meant. Um, but yeah, we're not sure about that. But anyway, so yeah, apparently, 
Almost. Jo. Uh, jo, according to London, at least for, for Saidic. Oh, with, in the Saidic spelling, sorry. Uh, oh, well, eraser, you really let me down with that one. Zoom annotation tools, is it like this, Jo? Yep, that's what he has, okay. that's right. Hmm? Okay, yeah, that's good. I'll go with that. Um, and if I said Jout, you know, if I got in a time machine and I was ordering in a restaurant and I said Jout, they would just go with it. Like the Germans do when I just make up plurals of things. <laughs> just make them up. <laughs> I don't want to know how many things I've made up over the years and in yeah. different languages. It's just, it's just part of the experience. Um, okay. So yeah, that was a pretty thorough analysis of that. With some um, just a question. You, I think you translated it as a past. Uh, no, um, I thought it was just they are taking. Okay, so yeah, it's it's the uh, uh, first present. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I thought so. And the R there is just uh, the the Achmimic version of A. I was thinking. It is, yeah. And now I'm realizing. I'm gonna go back to this. That's definitely the A. Eh. It's just A, um, Araf or something like that, um, or or just R or something earlier. Uh, and then it's unstressed, so it becomes A. Eh in Saidic and Bohairic, uh, because unstressed A-type vowels become epsilon. And then this breaks the stern Jernstedt rule, I think. Remind me, which was? Said GMO. So in the bipartite, there is no direct connection of the direct object. The rule states that okay, um, right. in, in the bipartite, you must use the uh, absolute form of the verb plus the uh, emma or era or whatever uh, pre-pronominal preposition to attach the direct object. So I would expect this to be, where'd my pencil go? Oh my gosh, what a scatterbrain. Okay, I would expect this to be seji emo. And now I'm, now I'm truly curious. Um, this is why I always tell you guys like, you know, rules are, Rules and language are just guidelines. Let's see if I can find one though. Uh, G2, I bet we will find a bunch of examples in other tenses. Uh, that's the first future, which where the rule doesn't apply. First future again, uh, preterite, circumstantial preterite, AL G2. Uh, so it doesn't apply. Uh, that's, that's a preterite too, because atote G2. Mm -hmm. Atote G2. Um, let's find G MO. Oh my gosh, it's going to break. I asked it to search too many times. Let's try again. Yep, it broke. <laughs> <laughs> it's odd awesome that uh, Lambden mentions Janstedt's rule. And uh, then he mentions a few exceptions, but he doesn't list the future as an exception. And one um, thing, the future would be a rather prominent exception. He mentions it in the in lesson twenty-five, the one that we were supposed to talk about today, he but does? we didn't have time for. Oh, I think so. Okay. I read it this morning quickly. I think he mentions it in there. Mm. So there's a to a GMO. Yeah, that follows the rule. Um, so it's not a rule that the verb G uh, always takes the direct connection of the direct object, like um, like Walsh really wants the direct connection of the direct object, so it doesn't follow the rule. Um, and Leo de Poit wrote a paper about that. He also, um, I asked him about the term preterite versus imperfect, and uh, oh. he got back to me on that and explained that it is, uh, so the way we use the word preterite is not exactly the, uh, the deepest original meaning. So uh, preter ire means to, to go by. Um, and then the, the meaning of the preterite as like a verb tense is the uh, presens in preterito or something like that. The, the present in the past. So it's taking a sort of present uh, durative action and just shoving it one step in the past. And that's the meaning that's being used in Coptic. And then uh, some of the confusion results from the use of the word preterite to refer to things that are especially perfective. So, um, 
So we say the preterite to mean uh, an action that was completed in the past, especially in reference to Spanish grammar. Um, although he also mentioned that he thinks that that association is also um, not perfectly complete. So there's this kind of false dilemma set up between the imperfect and the preterite, where the imperfect is ongoing action in the past, but the uh, preterite is completed action in the past. And he, he would argue that that's uh, not a real dilemma. They actually refer to different things. One refers to an ongoing event in the present that's been pushed into the past versus a uh, ongoing event in the past, I suppose. I don't want to misrepresent his argument, but that's what he wrote me about. Um, so yeah, that's, that, I thought that was kind of interesting. So mm -hmm. the term preterite is not as, um, it's not as inappropriate as it seemed to me because I was working with that uh, notion of like Spanish grammar. Interesting. G2. Yeah, um, I can search something better. Let's, let's do it this way. Let's just do GMO and see whatever forms. Yeah, they really, really do use it. Can it be anything else? I mean, Lambda has an answer key at the back, right? So I just look at that one. And he actually translates that sentence very differently. He says, hang on, where did it go? He says, they take him to the sick city. But that doesn't make any sense to me. Nope. CG2, how can that be him? You can't. Can't be right? um, Or CGMOF. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I think that's probably just an error. Is that or in this book? Not. It's in the book, yeah, at the back. Um, wait, wait, exercise nine. Oh, I forgot to look at the number. Never mind. Here it is. They take him to the city. No, that's just an error. Um, I proofread this book, so that's like <laughs> as much my fault as it is anyone's. <laughs> okay, it's so, so that easy doesn't to... make sense either. Interesting. Oh, we wait. We were in exercise nine. Yes. Amazing, my ability to forget, especially when, um, with an audience, it's like my memory just stops functioning in the same way. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is a, an exception to the rule, very interestingly, um, and it just reminds you that rules are made to be broken. Hmm. Okay. Wow, 20 minutes of mileage out of that one short sentence. Look at <laughs> us go. <laughs> We're never going to finish this book. Um, <laughs> Actually, it's getting up? shorter. Um, I just looked this morning. I mean... Next come the come the exercise explanations, and then comes the come the text, and that's it. I mean, there's still a couple of lessons left, but we're getting pretty close, actually. Yeah, I think there are twelve in total. Yes, twelve in total. And I think we're going to get to ten today, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> well, let's see what we can do. Okay, we have a we have a fun one here. Mustafa, do you want to try and do this one? Yeah. A fellow from all login, a war and pefellar pefellarin pefellarniste. Actually, first perfect. A fell el home. It is mm, probably Greek. Mm -hmm. It's probably in the um, something like this. homology. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Confess. And then um, uh, yeah. What did the L mean? Good question. Construct of Ely. Okay. So what, what verb is that? How do you know that verb? Note that this is in Fayumic dialect. Um, so it's a verb funny. that you already know. Yeah. They kind of talk like um, that, like uh, stereotyped pronunciation of like a Japanese person speaking English. And, and for good reason. So um, Egyptian, just like Japanese, had this phenomenon where R and L 
were really two allophones of one phoneme. So uh, okay. if, a, if a Coptic speaker were to speak English, they would probably flip the L's and R's around sometimes. Um, although that's not really, they're, they're, more, they're more solidified by the tongue of Coptic, but like if a, if a Middle Egyptian speaker were to try to speak English, they would definitely flip the L's and R's around. Yeah. Then um, he, he uh, has confessed confessed, he has confessed, yep. and uh, he do not uh, deny. Yeah, he confessed and he did not deny. So, um, not, no, yeah. what would this verb be in Saidic, Ili? Eire? Eire, yeah, good. Oh my gosh. Hang on, I have to close the window. It's like pouring rain. The rain's blowing in sideways and it managed to go through the little cantilevered window. Um, okay, and then this is the, the pre-nominal form. So I, I, I don't know for sure, but I imagine it's something like um, Ely, L. I don't know, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, something, and then O. Is it same with ear? It's yes, Egyptian. Is it Egyptian? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is uh, oh, weird. This is this. Ely. So um, you can kind of see one of the things that Egyptologists talk about a lot, but don't ever grow, go into great detail about uh, the hieroglyphic script, um, like much like uh, uh, the Chinese script can actually obscure a lot of dialectal variation because of the use of logograms. Um, so because this I symbol means iri, um, uh, yatef, if it's his I, or, or any, any combination of those things, um, all of those different possibilities for pronunciation just get subsumed under one symbol. Uh, so you kind of then lose the variation. It's similar, like in this way, similar like uh, cuneiform writing. Yeah. And that's probably uh, one of the reasons for the longevity of this style of writing, because Egypt certainly would have had variations in dialect throughout its history. Uh, we have plenty of circumstantial evidence for that, though not much direct evidence. Um, and it's likely that the hieroglyphic script actually served um, a, a beneficial role in that regard because it could um, serve the, sir, the uh, purpose of unite uh, unite United uh, State actually unite I mean Egypt uh, United Egypt cities something like that the United Egyptian cities yeah it's a major theme of Egyptian history for sure. Um, yeah. And it's also, I think it's the future theme of world history. I thought about writing a book about this. I don't know if I'll ever get around to it, but um, this um, separatism and reunification is a major theme in places where the entire available habitable area is uh, filled by um, interconnected people. So the Holy Roman Empire is a great example, right? It is just a, a patchwork of unifications and separations, um, really anywhere you look in history, where there are people in every place the whole time, you get this phenomenon of like separation and then reunification, um, normally along like existing fault lines. Um, I think that's almost certainly in the future for the United States, maybe in our lifetimes. Um, if if any place ever needed an intermediate period, it has got to be the United States, especially with like, you know, Delaware and Texas as like tax haven states, you need to set up toll booths. It's the only way you can like keep that economy functioning for the people everywhere. Um, but then that, you know, over time, the cost of, of separation becomes higher than the benefit. So there's kind of the seesaw effect where um, the central state, um, is very beneficial, especially in like 
reducing trade barriers and things like that, but it has a cost of its own and that cost grows over time inevitably. Um, so you kind of actually need those cycles of unity and separation uh, to maintain a, a, a balanced role for the state. Um, and I can't think of a single place, uh, history of China is full of that, really any place where people are throughout the area, you see those unifications and separations over and over again. So yeah, interesting stuff. If I ever formulate that idea more fully, I'll, I'll write a book. I think it'd be kind of interesting. I also want to kind of campaign for a American intermediate period uh, because it is, that place is so broken. Oh my gosh. Um, and we moved away. So there you go. Whose turn is it? Aurelio, do you want to do another one? I managed to figure this out uh, while you were. <laughs> so I, oh, I could, okay. I well, I was rambling. Then, if you don't mind. I'm glad, I'm glad that my rambling has some kind of beneficial consequence. Well, that's it's yours. <laughs> uh, so the Anak is the Fayumic form of Anok. So mm -hmm. it means I, the independent pronoun. And uh, Tijokem would be, I think, the first present. And the verb simply is jokem to, to wash. Yep. And here, I guess, the context will require that we say baptize instead. Mm -hmm. Then emoten is the uh, NMO uh, preposition suffixed with the second plural uh, suffix pronoun, which normally in, in uh, Saedic is written with a superlinear stroke over the N. Uh, yep. But here it's written out with an epsilon. And uh, the genumao is um, from the uh, reverse end, it's, it's mao as in water. Yep. And then u, the indefinite pronoun, so literally a water. And then gen, I guess, is in or in this case with. Yeah. So uh, I, either way. For my part, I baptize you with water. And yeah. it's the quote from somewhere in the Gospels where Jesus is. Uh, uh, where John is contrasting himself with the Messiah to come, who will baptize mm -hmm. people with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I, for my part, is a good way. I, for my part, will, will baptize you in water, but he, the one to come, will baptize you with a Holy Spirit. Yeah, great. Um, nice work on the dialectal variation there. Um, and yeah, this, this epsilon, I won't go into it again. Oh, it, isn't it just that the Saitic uses a superlinear stroke, but the other dialects really don't? Um, yeah, and the other dialects also do, but just there's just a lot of variation in there. I think mm -hmm. the main reason for the superlinear stroke, just like in medieval manuscripts, I think they're saving paper. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. more than anything. Uh, but I, I do also think it's kind of this. Um, there's a quality of of um, like root and pattern type languages where the positions of the vowels are much more flexible. So I think you also have it serving that role of just marking that like, there could be a vowel here, but if you have vowels on both sides, the vowel here will be syncopated. Um, so it gives you kind of this like um, uh, multivalence for the, the position and, and quantity of the vowel. That all makes sense. Do you know if there's a tendency for it to be more frequently used in Zaydic manuscripts or if it's it's about the same? Um, I think it is more frequently used in Zaydic manuscripts. I, um, I don't know what the explanation for that would be, but in, in other, it, even in Zaydic manuscripts, it you'll have epsilon sometimes and you'll have superlinear strokes sometimes. Mm. Um, in in Bohiric, you will often have the jinkim. Um, the best case I've ever seen for this is you'll have words like um, emau there, where uh, Saidic will put the superlinear stroke, mm -hmm. as you would expect. Where's my writing? And then uh, Bohiric can write uh, this, or it can write this. And you'll really, you'll actually see both within a single text. So I, I think it's pretty clear that in this case, there is no multivalence. It's just always going to be here, but this is the way we write that like, oh, there might be an epithetic vowel before or after, uh, you know, depends on the circumstances. Uh, so they just go on using that even in places where it's certain. I think that's probably the explanation. Yeah. There, there is no, um, there is no perfect explanation for this. The consensus is that it represents um, 
a syllabic consonant, or some people do still call it the murmur vocal. Well, um, I wonder about that yeah. because the, the syllabic consonant may, certainly makes sense when you see it, for instance, over an N or an M, but when you see it put over a P, it's hard to imagine a syllabic P. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is very hard to imagine a syllabic P. So I, I, I guess it needs to be some sort of memo vowel. Yeah, I, I think it definitely does need to be. I don't want to, so I have my own opinion about this and I, I mentioned the consensus, consensus in the interest of fairness. I don't want to give you guys, um, you know, a, a strictly biased reading of things. I think that um, there are arguments in favor of the syllabic consonant that address the issue of like plosives and, mm. and, and things like that. Um, but I, I just off the top of my head, I, I can't think of what they are, but I don't wanna pretend that there isn't such a thing because I think that would be unfair to that side of the argument. But it, um, it, yeah. I mean, I guess you can assume that it can denote both and which one it is needs to be decided in, in the, in, in whatever text you're, you're sitting at, depending on what letters are written next to it. Yeah, which actually is my hypothesis. Like, mm. I think it, I think the N could be a syllabic consonant in many, many cases, like in a word like sotem, you can say sotem mm. very easily, especially in rapid speech, you could easily imagine people using one or the other, uh, just like in English, we say uh, button, or if someone misheard you, um, if you said like, button your fly, they're like, what? Button your fly. Mm. It's very common uh, in a language that has phonemic syllabic consonants. We very often add a vowel for emphasis sometimes. So I, I think it's I think it's a very flexible reality. So yeah, cool stuff. I love those. I love the super linear strokes because it's one of this one of those like captivating mysteries. It doesn't matter at all, but it's just fun to think about. Okay, um, so that was Rasmus Aurelio. You want to do number eight? Let's do this one. That has quite some build up before the main <laughs> the main part. Umper tre peteten geet starte. Yep. Um, and luckily that is in the lesson. It says the optative is negated with a negative imperative, mm -hmm. imperative, plus the causative infinitive. That's what we have mm -hmm. here. So imper, don't, tre, let, peten geet, your heart, uh, starter, be startled. So yeah. yeah. That will be it, actually. That was good. Um, I'm glad it put that in the lesson because that's really helpful. Yeah, so imper, negative imperative, tre, the uh, causative, um, causative thingy, prefix, causative prefix. And then this is nominal, as you said, pet and hate, uh, y'all's heart. And then starter, be startled. Um, yeah. Obviously, the, a direct loan. Yes. From English, <laughs> and the other or way two, around. Two English, two English. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. Let's not let's not the, be silly here. Of the Great Migration, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Lost yeah. Tribe. Yeah. Oh God, Aurelio, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get us in so much trouble. <laughs> Whew, hot potato. I'm gonna get you all converted eventually. No worries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The Lost Tribe of, so it is, um, I think I can go on the record saying that, yeah, the word startle was brought into English by the uh, lost boat full of Egyptian mariners who reached the Gulf of Mexico in the year uh, 1000 BC, approximately. Uh, and that's why in American Gods, there is uh, Mr. Ibis, who is Thoth, uh, because he was worshipped by the Egyptians who arrived in the United States. I'm glad True we story. got that straight. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad we got that worked out. <laughs> there is actually, there is actually a trial uh, to Morocco, to uh, South American continent. As I remember, in 1970, or something like that, they made of Egypt style of Egyptian style uh, ship and opened the uh, cross the cross the ocean to the Brazil from uh, Morocco. Did they succeed? They didn't yeah. drown. Succeed. It, it is certainly possible with with the available technology. 
Um, actually, it is just a style, ancient Egyptian style shape. It is yeah. made of sim just similar like cap and bots. Um, or like, I mean, Kontiki is like, mm -hmm. that's oh, extraordinary, huh? but it's definitely, it was definitely possible. Um, I, the, the main question is whether it, whether we will ever find any evidence. And as of right now, we really have no evidence. The thing that's always used are like pyramids in, in um, like the Yucatan, but like a, a, a pyramid is a really efficient way to stack stone high. So it kind of doesn't yeah. demand contact. Um, so yeah, but I, I'm often on the side of, of the argument that ancient people had much broader contacts than we always find evidence for, because those things really don't often leave um, evidence that survives for thousands of years. Um, and there certainly is the things that we know of, like the, the presence of lapis lazuli in pre-dynastic Egypt. I mean, it must have come from thousands of miles away from Afghanistan. There are definitely trade routes that covered at least all of the old world at that time, uh, no question. We, and we know that for a fact. So could there have been contacts between the Americas and the old world uh, before Eric the Red? Um, sure, I'm not against that idea. I just don't think there's really enough evidence for it. Anyway. I've sent, I've sent uh, in Discord, there okay. is a documentary about this. Oh, cool. I'll totally watch that. Um, I don't know if y'all know this, but I'm a huge fan of ancient aliens. Um, and I watch those things and I enjoy every minute of them. Um, yeah. Is there a single yeah, series that has done more, more damage though? Nah, never I'm, mind. Let's not go oh, down no, no, that I'm path, not, but. I'm not a fan of what they're doing, um, but I do enjoy watching those shows because like if you've studied the subject forever, like, addressing those arguments is like shooting fish in a barrel. It's like the easiest, they're the easiest things to debunk in the whole world. So I have so much fun just watching them and like shouting at my TV. Uh, <laughs> no, that's true. I mean, it, it, uh, it is easy, but still most people believe it. They don't even take that second step um, because yeah, that's I, all they're being told, you know? No, I, 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 I worry Stargate, about that. When I, first, when I first watched it, I thought, oh, so much cool stuff they put in there. Now I can't even watch that movie anymore just because I know that most of my, my co-fellow, whatever. I mean, I mean, I'm not a citizen, so I don't want to say co-citizen, but the whole world around me basically believes all this as the literal truth. And it just drives me nuts because it's just demonstrably dumb. I mean, <laughs> I mean it. It there are people who believe that, but certainly it's not most people. Oh no, in the United States, it is almost it is. most people. Yeah. Most people. Uh, when I, when Up I into the highest people... circle. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah. yeah, like, um, what was, who is that politician who said that, like, what, the they, pyramids? They carved the pyramids on the inside or something? Yeah, that was, geez, who was that? Somebody of the Trump uh, cabinet, the housing, housing secretary, oh, what was his name again? Yeah. Brain surgeon, no less. Um, yeah. And, oh, they just carved inside the existing, Ben Carson, thank you. They just carved inside yeah. the existing pyramids, the, the Egyptians, because they were built by an alien civilization. It's like, Dude, this is not how any of this works. Um, that, that's amazing. He's that... an intelligent guy too. He's not. I, mean, I, I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> Isn't I'm that not the definition of not dumb. being? <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, he knows. He knows the things that he knows quite well. I'm sure. Um, and he doesn't strike me as as a dumb person. But people believe these things. And when I tell people I'm an Egyptologist in the U.S., one out of every three people ask me about aliens in the pyramids. Literally, it is. It, it like. Not only do I think most people believe it, but one out of three people, it's literally the first thing out of their mouth. Right. Um, so it is Absolutely. very, very popular. I think, I I think it's shocking that most people would believe that. I mean, that, that's certainly never been my impression, but then again, that's formed from, from Denmark. And I don't know anything about how people see this in the US. Europe is different. And I, yeah. it didn't bother me when I was there. When I saw it, when I was still living in Germany, it's like, oh yeah, this is fun. This is just something you laugh about. Um, but then when you realize that the whole society has been infiltrated by that, essentially like a collective uh, act of glue sniffing. I mean, everybody really yeah. believes this dumb sh Sorry. Um, this dumb you nonsense. You can say shit. It's okay. <laughs> we, all know what, we, we all know what shit is. Right, right, right. So yeah, in any case, um, 
when you see everybody literally believing it, it's just because of the greed of the people who made this program, because they can make a buck with it. It just oh, drives yeah. me nuts. It's no, just commercially people, driven. There is definitely <laughs> a special place in hell for those people. Um, <laughs> like, um, and, and a lot of these people, they their their central claim is always that like academics are hiding things from you, right. and that is that is so disingenuous because like we are not. We're not in charge of anything. We're we're normally like fighting for grant funding to do one small project for a short time. Well, we are what not would be like the wealthy and powerful for academics to do that. Well, I think I don't think there's an incentive. I think where there's a kernel of truth is in that because of the way the academic uh, system is set up, we are only incentivized to talk to one another. So in a sense, we are not intentionally. Uh, lying by omission to the public because we're not keeping up our end of the perceived social contract, which is to share information about things we learn with our fellow citizens. And that's, I mean, that's why this class exists, right? Because I think that is really important. I think I do have a, a moral obligation to share these subjects with other people uh, because I'm very privileged to have been able to study all these things. Um, it, it doesn't uh, benefit my career in any way to do this. And a lot of academics are, are much more um, kind of nose to the grindstone than I am. Uh, so that's that's where that really comes from. They're not intentionally misleading anyone, but they are leaving out a lot of things that people are curious about because they simply don't have the time or resources to, to address the public, uh, even though many of them want to. Like when I talk to other Egyptologists, they say all the time, like, gee, I wish I could just go on TV and just tell people about this exciting subject all the time. That would be so rewarding and exciting. But, but the academic system is designed with... Um, stem in mind mm. uh, which I, i'm i'm not one of those humanists who's like anti-stem i'm i took um i studied for a master's degree in math i i love the sciences uh but they they are very different circumstances and the the research paradigm that works for one does not work well for the other um so we're kind of stuck in this place where we've adopted the like the the publisher parish model and the kind of like you need to be putting out um, you know, finish research all the time so that other people can build on it. But that doesn't work the same way in the humanities that it does in the sciences because you can't, you normally can't build very much on the, the hundred or so papers that came out last month. Like none of them are even, it's such a huge subject. It's so diverse in terms of the topics that it covers and the, and the research methods and everything that I really can't use any of those things for what I do most of the time. Um, so we're not, we're, we're not building uh, because the, the system just doesn't work for this subject. Uh, so I think when I talk about ancient aliens, I always, I'm always, always careful to point that out. The people who believe that stuff are watching those documentaries in the first place because they're interested and they feel like there are not good sources of information available to them. And that really is a tragedy that yeah. people like me are it's going to have to... Kind of a tragedy. Yeah. It is. Exactly. And it's, exactly. it's going to take a lot of people doing what I'm doing before it gets fixed. And there's so much interesting stuff in the in the real Egyptology. And I see that for other topics too, the same, it doesn't matter where you go. If you go to say, for example, Indo-European uh, linguistics, um, oh, yeah. the same old nationalist tropes get rehashed and rehashed again and again on the internet. Um, instead of focusing on the stuff that's really interesting, what can you learn from the theory? What can you do with it? What can you actually derive from it? Same for Egypt. There's so many interesting stories we're talking about, and all we get is the same old, same old nonsense. Okay, I'll yeah, shut like up about it. But the, it the thing me. about <laughs> the um, intermediate period, like the 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 constant um, kind of uh, breathing in and out of the Egyptian state over time, mm -hmm. I think is an extraordinarily useful lesson for how we understand mo modern politics. And like, I think the United States, although it is, it, it is eating itself from within right now, I think it could be greatly improved with an understanding of those historical processes and kind of a, uh, like just a, a frank awareness of why these kind of things happen and that it's not necessarily a bad thing and we can anticipate it and react appropriately and make it as, as beneficial to the people as possible. But that's not, that's not getting out there. It's not reaching anyone. Um, yeah, so I, I should write that book. Maybe it will be useful. Anyway, okay, so uh, we have we have 10 minutes. We are going to do at least two more. And it is, who's, is Aurelius Tonner? No? Nope. Uh, Mustafa? I think Mustafa. Mustafa? 
Okay. Ereten, ereten, um, ten nash, nashope, e, enshire, em pu, way, way. Uh, actually, it is kind of uh, ereten, you all, or something mm -hmm. like that. You all will, uh, will, will be child, children mm -hmm. in, in the light. Yeah, of the light probably, but you know, in the light's fine. Child, um, children of the light. Yeah, so you translated this part. Oops, highlighted the wrong part, hang on. You translated this. What do you do with this? Hmm, actually, Something like converters. Yeah, which converter? Mm, rel relative nope. or circumstantial? Nope. Oh, it could be. Mm, no, it's no, it's not. I don't know. I think it's the the focalizing, so the second tense. Okay. Second. Yeah. I think this is a second, second future. Yeah. Okay, second future. Okay. We didn't uh, yes. learn actually. Yeah, I don't know if we've seen that yet. No, um, we haven't, I yeah. think. I'll put a line under it, like, I don't know what this thing is. <laughs> I think it's a second tense and it's, um, and what does it do? Um, what does it do? I'm pretty sure it's the second tense. I'm gonna look at the answer. Uh, it it normally, we normally say that it emphasizes an adverbial adjunct. So we would say something like, um, it is of light that you will become children or it is children of light that you will become as opposed to becoming something else. Um, note that because of the indirect connection of the direct object, technically uh, this could be the adverbial adjunct that is being emphasized, which is kind of a cop out, but. Um, you know, it's theoretically possible. Uh, wait, no, but nine, nine. here's the thing. Alan says in, in lesson 11, I'm just reading ahead here a little bit. He says, Ere is for nominal subjects. It is. And this is not nominal, is it? No, no, it's pronominal, but. Um, oh, okay, catch 22. But you can still use, because um, the second person plural is kind of strange, you often get the pre-nominal forms with second person plurals. Oh. So it's not, I mean, you could also say etin nashope, and that would be mm -hmm. fine too. Uh, but it's not, it's not automatically wrong just because it is the, the pre-nominal form. Ah. Oh, it's John 12, 36. Let's actually- Oh, here it is. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, actually 11, 12 forms, he has it as a as an alternative. He says, basically, it could be eteten or ereten yeah. for uh, lycopolitan. So it's... it's In it's any mentioned. case, it become ereten. And it's, you kind of get this dual um, influence where the ere form is also well known and it's kind of, it's queued up mentally when you use the pre-pronominal form like your brain automatically kind of links to the pre-nominal form as well. And then there's a phonetic similarity between etetin and eretin. So it's it's not at all surprising that uh, using one might occasionally draw out the other one. Um, well, you have the light, even the light, but sons of light you may become. Um, so that you may become sons of light. And then the, the Bahiric is missing apparently, um, but the Saidic, a tetan. Oh, this one actually uses a third future. A tetan is shope. Whereas, wait, could this be a tetan not? No, this is definitely, that na is very clearly there. So this has to be the second future. Um, I don't really see what else it could be. It could theoretically be a circumstantial. So when you, as you are going to become children of light, but that doesn't make sense in the context. Uh, I think the only thing it can be is a second future. So uh, it is children of light that you will become, or really the reason I tell you all this um, early on 
is so that you'll remember it when I repeat it later. I think the best way to translate the focalizing conversion is with the English emphatic construction. So uh, in the present tense, instead of saying, um, you're going to the grocery store, you would say, you do go to the grocery store. And what does that do for the meaning of the sentence? Well, um, you can imagine a scenario where it's like, um, well, I'm, I'm going to go uh, to the dry cleaners, but I'm not going to go to the grocery store. No, you will go to the grocery store. Then it's emphasizing the place where you will go. Um, or if it's if the previous sentence is, no, I'm not going to go to the grocery store today. You will go to the grocery store. Then it's emphasizing the 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 truth value of the claim, and as opposed to uh, the the alternative, which is that you don't do the thing. It can really do both of those things. And that's how it can be used in cases that are like um, sort of hortatory or just um, miratory, I think, the admirative, no, miratory, is not that the word, miratory? Where it's like, um, uh, may you have a good day or something. That's kind of a, a situation where you might use a focalizing conversion. Um, there's one, there are a few examples of that in the text of the Bible where someone says, uh, like expresses surprise, like they did arrive on time or something like that. That's a case where you would use the second tense, even though there is no um, adverbial component being emphasized. Really, if you just use the English emphatic, uh, you will often get, like the, the correct meaning will sort of fall out from the translation just as it does from the Coptic. So uh, you shall become children of the light is, probably the best way to translate this because it has this um, notion of like um, obligation or inevitability. And then we can kind of see that in the, the corresponding Saidic use of the third future, which also has that, um, that like secondary implication. It will be so. Does that all make sense? Okay. I know that's kind of a lot. Yeah. Okay, and we have one left. Does anyone have questions about this? Next time you see a second tense, try that thing, try to make it an emphatic type sentence and uh, see whether it works for you. I've had very good results with that. I think it works better than the cleft sentence. Like it is children of light that you will become. To me that- Yeah, no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 you're fine. No, no, but complete your sentence I'll ask after. Oh, okay. Um, I feel like the cleft sentence is hard to construct and often obscures the, the meaning that the sentence is going for. Okay, so my question uh, was a bit backtracing a bit. The, the term converter, is that used for everything you snatch on uh, the front of a verb form that isn't, that serves to indicate some sort of tense or functional relationship that is, it seems to me that Lambden uses it for a very specific set of um, prefixed uh, morphemes mm -hmm. that relate to the bipartite construction. But yep. it seems, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding him correctly, but it seems that he doesn't use it for the A ah of the first preterite. But it's- uh, No, it's no, because that's not a converter. That is a, uh, that is a verbal base. And it's kind of one of these things where we're, we're, we're fudging the definitions a little bit so that the rules still work. So the, the ah of the preterite uh, or the, the past, the past ah um, hmm. produces a tripartite. So yeah. the converters are things that do not affect the, the um, oh my gosh, I've just lost all my words. Do not affect the, uh, determination, I guess, the quality of being bipartite or tripartite. So if you say, uh, ne sotem, I was listening, mm -hmm. um, that ne at the beginning is a converter because ne sotem is still bipartite, even though, strictly speaking, it is made of three parts, ne, e, sotem. Um, so it's a way of kind of fudging the definitions so that we don't screw up all the rest of the grammar. Because like the stern Jenstedt rule still applies to uh, ne sotem, you can't say ne sotmef, you have to say ne sotememof um, mm. because it is still bipartite and all of the other rules about it being 
um, historically from a, an adverbial sentence still apply. So, but but anyway, you you have the sotum, which is the infinitive, and then say you have nen sotum instead. That means we were listening, but then mm -hmm. you can have an sotum, and then the a and the ne in those two sentences. The one is a converter, and, and the other one isn't. The, the a of yeah. an sotum isn't a converter, but the ne of nen sotum is a converter. Yes. And this is for historical reasons, partly. So the all of the things that are converters were truly separate words that could be stuck on the beginning of a sentence to affect the entire clause. Um, so whereas un, un doesn't derive from two separate things, or no, it's from uh, it's the sejimf of iri. I did oh, hear oh, right. Yes. So it is actually a, a finite verb itself. So mm. the sentence is no longer an adverbial sentence. It's now a verbal sentence. And so the same grammatical rules don't apply to that sentence. Uh, but okay. if you put a converter in Lady Egyptian, if you put when now, it's still an adverbial sentence. It doesn't affect what's internal. It just does something to the entire clause. Mm. So it's, you can think of it kind of like a, a wrapper versus a, uh, a like a member method or something. If you were to adopt a purely synchronic analysis of Coptic, as we have it preserved, um, is there still a functional distinction between the a and the ne? Yes. Or uh, because the ne, when you put the ne, it doesn't stop being bipartite. So it doesn't. So for instance, the the Sternjernstedt rule still applies. You can't mm -hmm. have a direct connection of the direct object. Um, so. You, if you were to do a purely synchronic analysis, you would still see that there are uh, grammatical rules that only apply to certain classes of verbs, and putting that net at the beginning doesn't move it into the other class of verbs. Yeah, of so course, it's different. That makes sense. But but both of them seem to uh, serve to indicate some sort of ten tense or aspect of the verb. Yes, and that that is true. That is what they do, and um, functionally speaking. They are almost identical, except for these um, downstream effects, mm. like how the direct object works and things like that. Yeah, okay. So we okay, really need that. that, that a bit of confusion that needed clearing up. Sorry for that. It's no, just, I'm glad you asked. It's, it's a, a, it's a big mean. topic. Mm. It is also very bewildering because our terms are so self explanatory, like bipartite and tripartite. And then you get like, ne isotem is bipartite. And it's like, what? It has three parts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so now in order for that to still be bipartite, you have to call the ne something else. It can't really be part of the verb. It has to be a sentence level converter, uh, which is true, but it's also kind of a, a bit of like definitional convenience, right? We're defining our terms around what we need them to do. Hmm. Yeah. Should I try the last sentence? Sure. So it goes, Maren uh, Hothebev. I'm not quite unsure of how to. Oh, uh, I see Alan even has a nice trans transcription. Oh, I uh, ah. <laughs> It has a translation. I'm sorry. Uh, he also has translation. Yeah. Okay. But I figured it out anyway. So uh, the um, from the end, the F is, of course, the third person singular masculine uh, suffix pronoun. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the hotep is to kill. Yep. Um, so kill him. And then the maren is the first person plural form of the optative mar, um, which is a new form introduced in this lesson. Yeah. It actually uh, comes from uh, d iret or, or d iren. Yeah, it's a, so, the give verb. Yeah, give yeah. give that we do. Mm. Give that we do his killing. Yes. Literally. So okay. let us kill him. Let us kill him. How do you get it? Probably. Hmm? I have to from, ask. Uh, the the imperative of D becomes. Oh. Ah. Ah. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, so it's, no, it's a I different base, a different verb base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I imagine this is how uh, my students are feeling after we go way over time. So we'll stop here. <laughs> he always runs over time. Let's kill him. He does though. All right. Oh, so, so I will see y'all next week, I suppose, or maybe Friday if you decide to come to reading. Thanks. Okay. Is there, Hi, is there uh, hey, is there yep. any reading?
lesson in Friday? Yeah, there's a reading class. I mentioned I don't, it. Uh, how, how to join it? Actually, I don't. I didn't know that. Okay, uh, send me an email, and I'll send you the information about the class. Okay. Okay. I'll send. All right. Okay. See y'all soon. Have a good okay. one. Bye bye. Yeah.